Our scripture lesson today comes from the wisdom of the Bible. Uh, You may have heard the term proverbial wisdom. Uh, Here it is from chapter 6. Let's share in God's good word together. Here are six things God hates and one more that he loathes with a passion. Eyes that are arrogant, a tongue that lies, hands that murder the innocent, a heart that hatches evil plots, feet that race down a wicked track, a mouth that lies under oath, a troublemaker in the family. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Um, I think a good habit for everybody to get into is if you're going to have a conversation with somebody and you want a one-on-one conversation, like what you said in your last sermon, I think if you just take your phone out of the equation, like out of your pocket, out of your sight, whatever, you're going to connect with that person so much better than if it's in your pocket. Because if, I, if I'm having a conversation with like my aunt or my dad or my mom or something and I get a notification, my brain immediately went, oh, I wonder who that is. I wonder what they need. So if I take that out of the equation or, or anybody else, if you take that out of the equation, you're not going to think about that. And you're going to actually retain what the other person is saying because it's important. So that's my last little thing. I would like to say ditto and same with smartwatches. If you really are wanting to do things like this and have those conversations, all technology needs to go because you will get distracted. Uh, I've been so grateful to our young people. Uh, We were able to visit uh, a few weeks ago uh, around technology, and they have a lot of wisdom to share. And so today we're going to come to truth, discerning fact from fiction. And what I find is that many times our young people are better at it than I am. Um, One of the things that we do when we run the sermon every Wednesday is that we try to fact check everything that we do. And it's so hard now when it comes to quotes, because so many times somebody quotes somebody else who quoted somebody else who quoted somebody else. Now, who do you who do you say said it? Well, they all said it, but they all said it maybe just a little differently. And so who does the quote go to? And so we're talking about truth discerning the fact from fiction, um, I, I could tell you that we made those students say that exactly. <laughs> but we didn't. They actually said that on their own. Way to go. Um, they understand the power of distraction and, and the, both the promises and the perils uh, of technology. So today, as a, as a quick recap, we're almost done with this series. We'll finish it up next week uh, with If Jesus Had an iPhone. That ought to be interesting. Uh, we'll work on that. Um, but one of the things we found is that, that what's so interesting about technology is that it promises us more, while at the same time, life expectancy in the U.S. peaked a decade ago, in 2014. It, it went all the way up to 78.9 years, and then it's been dropping every year since. That's not true in all places, but it is in the U.S. It is in the U.S. So while it promises more, our experience of satisfaction and actually life itself Uh, is going the wrong way. So what you do with your tech today, it has massive implications for your soul tomorrow. What you put in your mind, what you read, what you scroll, what's in your feed, all of that affects who you are and more importantly, who you're becoming, who you're going to be forever. And that's why Proverbs says over and over again, watch over your heart, your soul, right, your will with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life. It all comes out of who you are because who you are chooses your next step and then that step chooses your next step and the ne- you know the next thing you know, it's your life. That's your whole life. And, and so sometimes we think that if we can step back in our, in our social media, particularly, have you ever noticed that everybody's on vacation? When you, when you, when you get to your Instagram, it's like, how? They were on, they were on vacation last week. And it just seems like everybody's on vacation but you. Is that just me? It seems like, like everybody's on vacation. Everybody was at OU Texas but me. Or, you know, everybody's on fall break but me. Or whatever it is. That, that, that's not good for your soul. It's not good for your soul. So, so this is the thing about social media. It's a megaphone, friends. And, and when you put something out there, it, there's more people potentially overhearing you than you could ever imagine. And, and part of the reason for that is I, I actually went through my Instagram feed yesterday, and it goes back a decade. I don't even want to remember what I did a decade ago. But it's out there forever. And so whatever I post, I, you know, when you're posting, do you think, oh, that's going to be around for my children to see 10 years from now? 
Will they, will they understand the context of what that is? Should I go back and delete things back? Some of the kids are like, yeah, we do this all the time. But, you know, for, for those of us of my age, this is all new. And so the power and the peril is this, that technology gives us unlimited access to the knowledge of good and the temptation of every kind of evil. It really is the tree of life. The knowledge of good and evil. Right there at the back of your MacBook. And you can use it for good or ill. Friends, technology is neutral. But you know, the Bible is true when it says, seek and you will find. And that is true whether you're seeking Jesus and his ways or seeking darkness and those ways. If you seek it, it'll give it to you. You'll find it. It's simply an axiom. It is true. It is the case. When Jesus speaks, he's speaking truth into the world because he is truth itself. And it's important that we get sober about that. Jesus isn't some moralist trying to get you to do this, trying to get you to do that. He's simply saying, look, gravity works. And lies are what you bump up against when you come against reality. I mean, you don't have to believe in gravity. I don't have to believe in it. But if I go right there, that's going to be painful to me. Right? If I jump down, that's going to be hard on me. Whether I'm, I can believe I can fly. I mean, that's a nice song, but it doesn't work for me. So here's, here's a working theory of the devil's strategy that's at war with your soul. And, and the first part is this, what we're looking at today. Deceitful ideas that play to disordered desires, our flesh, that are normalized in a sinful society, the world. John Mark Comer has an entire book uh, called Live No Lies. And, and he basically lays it out like this. It's, you know, it's the devil gives you a deceptive idea, right? Have you ever been driving in the car and, and it's a beautiful day, it's, you know, 80 degrees outside, sun shines, beautiful day, and you're driving, and, and maybe this never happened to you. Um, and, and you're in a good mood, you're not even in a bad mood. And this thought comes in your head, uh, just driving down an embankment. You could end everything right now. You're not depressed, you're not sad, it just comes in your mind. You're in complete control, you can, you can kill yourself right now on I-35. Friends, that happens. It happens to people all the time. Do you think that's coming from you? Well, no, that makes no sense. Your ego isn't trying to end you. Your ego wants to last forever. So where does that come from? There is a, a, a devil, and it's working against you. And, and if you're not in a good place, if you are depressed, if you are struggling, it, it might get real dangerous for you, as it has for thousands before you. And it really plays to your disordered desire. Like, yeah. I'm in a fight with my wife, or my boyfriend broke up with me, or uh, I lost my job, or whatever it is. And then all of a sudden, that temptation, that lie, that somehow that's going to be good for you, gets really dangerous. And then, of course, you know, we, we see it happen all the time in the world. Right? That, I mean, that's how it works. And it does us no good to pretend that that's not out there. It's actually dangerous for us, particularly if we don't share this reality, this truth, with one another and our children. You see, our war against the three enemies of the soul, it's not a war of guns and bombs. It's not even against other people at all. It's a war on lies. Lies that come into your head. And what you do with them. And whether you have a community around you to push those back. And the problem is less that we tell lies and more that we actually come to live them out. And we let false narratives about reality into our bodies. And they wreak havoc on our souls when we begin to believe them. Now... Before I get too heavy, too late, um, we all lie, don't we? We all lie. We, we don't want to admit this, but we do. And so you say, well, hold on a minute. What is a lie exactly? A lie, this, this was a Sunday school teacher asked their kids and said, what is a lie? And the little one goes, a lie is an abomination to God and a present help in times of trouble. <laughs> that is to misquote scripture. That is not... That is not in the Bible. That part's in the Bible. That part's in the Bible. They don't go together. And that's what the devil does. You see, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in times of trouble. It's God. And that's, the, that's what makes a lie great. It makes it super effective. If 95% of what you're saying is true, all you got to do is switch God for lie. And people will believe it. 
And any teenager that's worth their salt knows this by now. You never lie wildly to your parents. You lie just a little bit. And the rest of the sentence is true. By the way, parents, don't be mad at me. They already know this. Right? So the most effective lies are the ones that are mostly true. And so when, when Adam and Eve come to the tree, they did, you know, the devil didn't say, that's not a tree. The devil says, now what exactly did God say about this? Let's change it just a little. You see, when we call something a lie, we mean it doesn't correspond to reality. Lies distort our souls and drive us into ruin one little step at a time. Now, let me ask you, how many times do you think an American lies? Four times a day. Like four times, that seems like a lot. Well, not, not if you think about it like this. When, haven't you ever gone to work or maybe even at church? Maybe you lie at church. Somebody says, hey, how's your day? And you go, good. Which everybody knows means not good. But you're, you're not ready to get into it. You don't want to share that or we're not in the right public space or it's not the right time. But it's also not true. And so we do this all the time. But if we're not careful, what we can create is a world where we almost never tell the truth. We just tell 95% of the truth. Because I'm mostly good. I'm mostly good. All right. So I have a friend, Jean Marie, um, and she asked it like this, what are your favorite lies? You know, the lies you tell yourself. What are the things you repeat over and over in your head that are actually not true that you buy into as if they are true? What's your favorite lie? We all have them. Here's, here's some that are pretty common. I hear this all the time. I don't have time. Friends, anybody that's past fourth grade science knows you have the same amount of time everybody else has. Right? You have 24 hours a day. It's really about prioritize. What you might say is, I've not yet mastered myself or my inability to stop scrolling or my laziness to get out of bed or I just hate walking, period. I don't have time to walk. I don't have time to talk to my kids. I don't have time. You've got the same amount of time as everybody else. How you choose to do it that time is up to you. We all know this. Now, from there it gets a little harder. I'm not enough. Well, sure, who says? God says you're enough. God says you're wonderfully made. This one, everybody uses that one. Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Now, this one will act, this next one will wreck your life. It absolutely will wreck your life. It's just the way I am. I, now, the, the, the reason this wrecks your life is because what, that, what you're saying is, I refuse to change. I know I'm being mean to you right now, but it serves me. It's just the way I am. You, you see how this works? It's not just the way you are. You have agency. You have choice about whether you're going to be a jerk today or not whether or not you're going to pout all day or whether you're going to actually grow up. I mean, it's not just the way you are. It may have been the way you were raised, but you actually can change it if you want to, which leads to the other big lie. I don't have a choice. Or they made me. I don't have a choice. I have a friend, Bill McCowan, who's a pastor on the East Coast, and when we were in seminary together, we were walking, and I still remember this. He looked at me in his southern drawl from South Carolina, and he said, you know, my grandma used to always say to me, the only thing you have to do, son, is die. To which I said, what about death and taxes? And she goes, nope. <laughs> <laughs> All you got to do is die. Mm. But you can also choose to live. And then, of course, you can fill in your own blank here. I'm too, pick it. You're not too anything. You're made in the image of God. And you can grow that if you'd like. That's what we're here to do, to try to help you do that. And not let anybody or anything lie to you about that. Because the lies lead to sin, separation from God. How does that work? Well, we sin because we believe a lie about what will make us happy. Haven't any of you all ever been, like, kind of hungry? And you haven't eaten right all day, or maybe eaten at all, and you come across a really beautiful piece of chocolate cake? Or maybe a whole chocolate cake? And you think, oh, that looks great. That'll make me happy. And then you have your sugar high, 
and your sugar crash, and you feel terrible. Did it make you happy? Maybe for a few seconds. So the most dangerous lies are the ones we tell ourselves, both personally, like we've talked about, or as a society. Uh, Yasha Monk has a new book coming out, and, and this is one that's really tr- problematic for us right now going into the election, and that is that there's this n- new novel idea, right, this ideology, it's haunting us, the insidious lie that we can't understand each other. You hear this all the time. You're not so-and-so, you just can't understand. You're not in that position, you just can't understand. And of course, the problem with that is there's some truth in that, of course. But if we let we can't understand each other mean we can't ever get along, we can no longer talk, then that's the ruin of us. We have to be able to understand each other at some level. And that's the beauty of the book of Acts chapter 2, where it's the Holy Spirit that brings people who used to be at war with one another, people who used to kill each other, people who used to curse one another, and they become the church from every tribe and every nation from all over the world with the Holy Spirit in charge, no longer their ideology or agenda. Can I understand you perfectly? No, of course not. Can you understand me perfectly? No, of course not. It doesn't mean we have to jump into these ideological tribes. Not at all. You see, Jesus sees our primary war against the devil as a fight to believe the truth over lies. Jesus comes that he can fully understand us as a human. And so this is what Jesus says about himself. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right? The truth. Well, friends, if Jesus is truth, then that's the way you have to come. Because there are no lies allowed in heaven. Those of you who know me well uh, know that I'm super reticent uh, to preach from Revelation because my professors told me no one understands what it means. Right? Because it's all in, in symbol. But there are two things I think we, we can take away from Revelation. I want to share with, them, with you very quickly. One is God wins. At the end. And that's important to know. And the second is that lies don't exist in heaven. Which means liars don't exist in heaven. Not because God's mad at you, but because only truth reigns. Because Jesus is the truth. And so it's written this way in the symbolism of Revelation. And the one who was seated on the throne, which I understand is Jesus, says, see, I'm making all things new. That's what Jesus does. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Jesus is the truth. Then he said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Those who conquer will inherit these things, will hold fast. I'll be their God. They will be my children. Yes, but as for all liars, well, that has to be checked at the door. You can't go into heaven and tell someone they're ugly because that doesn't exist in heaven. Right? You can't lie. But, and, and so their place is outside of heaven, and it's described as a, a lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And so, friends, the, the thing that's important that you realize here is that lies kill, lies steal, lies destroy, and lies have no place in heaven. They cannot exist there. And so if you've come so accustomed where you can't live without them, then you're going to have a hard time when you get to those choices. It's not because God's mad at you. It's because your character has been formed which is why we talk about it every week here, because it is about your character. And technology has then magnified our ability to tell lies or to spread false information and made it harder to discern the truth. That's certainly true for me. It just gets harder and harder to know, is that really true? Or was that true two years ago? A study from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, found that false news spread six times faster than true news. Well, that's an uphill climb then, isn't it? I can spread something true, and nobody cares. I can spread something salacious, and man, it is everywhere. By the way, most of you probably don't know this, uh, the United Methodist Church, this part you will know, has been on the front page um, of our state paper, uh, seems like forever, certainly over the last number of months. Um, On Thursday, the state Supreme Court said basically all of that was bunk, And uh, we'll tell you more about that later in opinion, but the Supreme Court ruled unanimously in favor of the United Methodist Church as a whole, which I think is great. But you probably don't know that because it's not on the front page, because it's not salacious. It's because, oh, by the way, the agreement we all entered into as United Methodists, where we're going to hold property in common, it's still the case. Nobody cares. But it can be confusing, can it? People say, oh, well, I thought you had to, you know, church had to split, had to have votes, all that. Nope, none of that's true. It's not true. 
So why does this happen? Why does falsehood travel six times faster? Because offense seeks validation, not the truth. If, oh, I'm offended. You don't really care if it's true. You just want to jump on and get back at somebody because you're so offended. Well, if you might stop first and go, well, hold on a minute. Is what they're saying actually true? And if not, how much of it is true? Because that's how lies work. Now, this is going to be really embarrassing to me, but I'll share it with you anyway because it's important. And that is that nearly 40% of Americans report having inadvertently shared misinformation without checking to see if it was true. This happened to me. I know, I'm trying to be really careful, but we were not, I don't think we were even in this building, we were not in this building yet, I don't think. Somebody came up to me, one of the matriarchs of our church actually, whom I trusted implicitly, and, and she said to me, uh, this was a Sunday morning, happened the first thing Sunday morning, and it was about right before we had annual conference as a whole, as a whole state. And she came up to me and she said, hey, did you know that Bert at First Methodist had a stroke? Now, Bert's a colleague of mine, Bertha Potts, wonderful lady. I see her every Monday night, even now. Um, so here's the thing. I love Bert. They've got a good relationship. She did not have a stroke. <laughs> but because a, a person in my church who I love told me that we needed to pray for her, I asked the church, will you please pray for Bert over at first because they had a stroke. And we were like, yes, you know, oh, how's she doing? I'm like, I don't know. I can't get a hold of her. It's because she was on vacation. <laughs> Imagine my surprise when I was at annual conference and one of the members, a wonderful man who was representing his church, well, came up to me and said, what are you trying to do? And I said, what? He goes, telling lies about our pastor that she... She had a stroke. I said, that's what I was told. Is that not true? He said, no. It was an old man named Bert. <laughs> Secretary got it flipped around. Or, you know, this is how it works. I was spreading absolute falsehood with a good heart. I was just, I was just trying to be a team player. I, I love Bert. I, I want to be praying for him. We want, you know, every United Methodist Church is another Methodist church that we're trying to support and love. We're not in competition with anybody. I thought I was doing the right thing. Ooh, that guy was mad at me. And rightly so. I mean, my heart was right, but there was no way for me to check. And so I just I thought, well, we'll pray for him. And by the way, it's worked. As far as I know, Bert's never had a stroke. <laughs> so, go God. But changing our behavior, it takes effort. Harvard Business Review says it takes deliberate effort. We have to increase our self-awareness. Like, Mark, don't do that. Okay, got it. Make commitments. I mean, tell people. So if you tell me where you need to pray for somebody, I'm like, hold on. I need a police report. <laughs> Make commitments. Then, then I have to overcome my own interference, right? Like, oh, well, you don't need to check on that. That's, you, know, you know that. And then finally, we have to practice it. Over and over and over and over and over again. We have to practice we have to practice being truth tellers when it's easy because if you don't do it when it's easy it's really hard to do it when it's hard and so how are we going to spot fake news this year how are we going to do it right because it's everywhere it's everywhere um this graphic is from the international federation of library uh, association and institutions and so um you can find it for yourself but i want to take you through it real quick first of all consider the source consider the source really look at it and so um, I'm on a roll here. I think I'm three weeks in. Um, but NASA plans to build houses on the moon by 2040. Is that true? Yeah, actually it is. You know why I know? I called my son who works at NASA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he didn't know. He sent me an article from the Times. And uh, he's like, Dad, I don't know that kind of stuff. That's not what I do. Um, but, he, but here's the thing. Or you just got to check. And that is actually a plan that they have. And the other thing is you can do is you can check the author. Right, you know that there are some authors out there that they really do give you headlines to inflame. And there are other authors that that's the last thing they want to do. And if you watch people over time, um, you, can, you can see that. For me, uh, I've come to really appreciate um, David Brooks uh, and Arthur Brooks. Uh, those guys, I, I don't see them make many mistakes when I read them. And so those guys are helpful to me. You can also then, of course, read beyond the headline. Uh, a congregant sent me this this week. Um, that Tom Hanks is actually going around and saying, hey, I am not selling um, dental insurance, dental plans. But they made an AI version of him, and, and he's like, hey, you need this dental plan. And so he has to spend his time now to go, no, I didn't, I didn't do that. 
Now, the other one that's super important these days is that we have to slow down and check the date. So I don't know what comes to your feed, but I was, I was really excited, and then I was like, oh, no. Is Jimmy Carter 99 or is he dead? Right? Because I, I don't know. I don't check on Jimmy's health every day. And so, you know, I'd love to tell you that, that basically he's quoting Wesley here. I have one life and one chance to make it count for something. My faith demands that I do whatever I can, wherever I am, whenever I can, for as long as I can with whatever I try to make a difference. That's great. I want to share that with you. But what if he's dead? So I got to check. He's alive. He's 99. Right? He's not in great health, but that's actually real. So you have to check the dates because a date today, right, particularly if you're looking at like medical information, what was true during COVID versus what's true today, wildly different, wildly different. Proverbs again says the naive, will, they'll believe anything, but the prudent, they give thought to their steps. And then of course you can look at what are the supporting sources. Are there any? Are there any footnotes? Um, you know, I was amazed to see that there have actually been people that have gotten pretty famous that don't exist. They were simply created by AI. And then they would say super inflammatory stuff. And they're like, oh, hey, they were on the Obama administration. That person didn't even ever exist. It's not even a person. And First John, I mean, you think, well, what does the Bible have to do with this? Well, there's wisdom in the Bible if we pay attention. And in First John, it says this, beloved, do not believe every spirit. Say it with me. Do not believe every spirit. And by the way, you don't even have to believe me. Check me. You got a Google in your hand? Check it. Which, by the way, makes my job super hard. Right? Because you can check everything I say. And, and that's fine with me if you do. Because the truth is what sets us free. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God or from many false prophets have gone out in the world. Certainly that's true. And then, sometimes it's just a joke. Just is. Sometimes there's things like the onion or the Babylon bee, and they're just trying to be funny. And then this is, this is a little harder, and that's check your biases. Right? I mean, if you already believe something, it's real easy just to, to go with it. But Jesus says this. See, I'm sending you out, like, say it with me, sheep into the midst of wolves. So, again, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Now, when Jesus is saying that, he's, he's not saying be like, be like the devil, a serpent. No, he's like, serpents were known as being crafty and smart. He's like, so yeah, be, be wise, but also be gentle, be innocent. But don't fall for everything. The world doesn't need a bunch of country bumpkin Christians out there. I mean, that, we get enough bad press as it is. I mean, we are people of both faith and knowledge, right? And then finally, this only makes sense to me, if you're having heart problems, I hope you'll ask a cardiologist, not your Facebook friends, right? If you're having mental health issues, see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, you know? Don't put it on Facebook Marketplace. Anybody got any good pills to make me feel better? That's dumb. Really ask people who know, who are educated, who've spent their life learning these things. Because again, in 1 John, he says, little children, let no one deceive you. We're to be people of, that people can trust. Not only are we not supposed to be gullible, we're also supposed to be able to, you know, engender trust over time. And that's why community is so important. You have to learn people over time, right? I, I don't really trust anybody I meet first reference. I mean, that's kind of wise, really. I mean, you ought not just believe everything the first person you see tells you. Now, here's something interesting to me. Artificial intelligence and conspiracy theories. I want to thank David Horton for uh, learning me up on some stuff. Um, Here's, here's the thing. There, I mean, it has just been rampant these days uh, between COVID uh, lockdowns and mandates and wild claims about 9-11, supposed revelation on alien corpses. Um, some of y'all know John Fetterman, by the way. Uh, the con la latest conspiracy is that's a body double. He's 6'8". You know how hard it is to find a body double at 6'8"? Like, come on. He wore a mustache one day. I couldn't find the photo. And everybody's like, that's not him. Come on. So when it comes to AI and, and making people um, believe different things, Kate Lucky of Christianity Today says it like this. She says, AI will shape your soul, but how? It's up to you. It really is. And so when it comes to AI, there's lots of debate raging around. All you have to do is, is look it up these days. Elon Musk um, and Steve Wozniak, uh, these are two pretty well-known names uh, in the tech world, 
Uh, they actually caused, uh, asked, asked for a pause in the development of AI that was more advanced than GPT-4. Uh, they, they wrote a letter, and the letter asked whether humanity should actually even develop non-human minds that might eventually outnumber or outsmart uh, or obsolete and re actually replace us, uh, then risking loss of control of our lives and our civilizations. Now, again, AI can be neutral. It can be great. AI can actually spot lesions and mammograms. And depending on which report you read, some think they do that better than humans at this point. Others flatly deny that. They can track wildfires. They can pass the bar exam even. And they can write a screenplay. Not one that's on Broadway yet, but they can write one. So, I mean, all of that's out there now for AI. And then with all that comes conspiracies and conspiracism. And, and that's um, defined as a cynical and fearful mindset which frames everything around the assumption that the world is beset by a grand secret evil and only a few know what's really going on. And you're like, well, Pastor Mark, haven't you just told us that the world is full of evil? Yeah, but it's not a secret. Everybody knows that. I mean, there is a war going on, but it's not that just a few people know it. Uh, Dr. Anthony Roden, who's here today, uh, he teaches an entire course uh, on conspiracies. He says, for a faith that rightfully claims to be based on truth, which we do, Jesus, these new technologies are going to make being a wise media consumer all the more difficult. It does. So we've got work to do. Uh, raise your hand, Anthony, so people know who you are. So talk to him. He knows the answers, right? <laughs> But so here's the thing. AI-generated content can be difficult to recognize and nearly impossible to discern who's responsible. If it can generate its own stuff, well, is that its idea, the person who's put it in its idea? If it's an amalgam from the Internet, how do you know who's responsible? Well, it gets difficult. And then you have to ask, does anybody care? Because a growing number of people are more loyal to their ideology or political party than they are to Jesus and his teachings. And if that sticks, we're in for a big, big problem. But it is difficult. Um, I want to show you. Uh, this is me and David. There's David. And some of Mark's video. Correct. And he's live, or or he's on. He he virtually streams services every yep. Sunday. So why can't I just grab his stream and hijack Mark for my own purposes? Because, so you yeah. can't. I mean, you can see all the people that are listed oh. on there. There's a lot of folks you can select from. Who should I want to look like? They're all like named. I'm Tom Cruise. I noticed that. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's like a legal thing. Copyright. Like they're trying to it's dodge. Be... They've changed all the names. Nope. I'm Elon Musk. I'm Elon. Oh, I'm Elon, 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 Elon Musk now. That's very oh. scary. Oh. Right. Yeah. Woo. Right. So they took my voice. And they've got my image. And if you see next week, Pastor Mark, you know, jumping from a helicopter, asking for money, it's not me. It's not me. But they can make it look just like you with your real voice, with your real movements. It's not. I mean, you do that right here in town. But Jesus says this, friends. Pay attention. Pay attention. Be wise. You shall know the truth, and it is the truth that shall set you free. And it's super important what we're doing, friends. Because the truth of Jesus, it's not just some axiom that's just thrown around. It's actually the saving truth of God's love for us. Because when we get that right, we know that we are worthy. We are enough. We are loved. And that sets us free from the lies that you're not enough. From the sin of, of trying to, you know, allowing people to treat you in ways as if you're unlovable. Because you are lovable. God loves you. And death itself. It is a battle for life and death with truth and lies. They go together. And so here's the thing. We can spread lies or we can spread love. That's our choice. And, and I would say to you, I think we have to be more careful about being intentional never to spread lies so that we can even unintentionally spread love. Because you can't do both. Andy Crouch says, if we are going to live as flourishing families in an age of easy everywhere, we're going to have to decide Together, that nothing is more important than becoming people of wisdom and courage. And then we have to commit to make every major decision on the basis of these questions. Will this help me become less foolish and more wise? Really checking my stuff. And will this help me become less fearful and more courageous? So here's your action steps. Uh, we've talked about them before. Think this through, right? Yeah. First, is it, say it with me, is it true? You can go to factcheck.org if you don't know how to do that. 
right? Is it helpful? You can go to Snopes.com. Is it inspiring? You can go to PolitiFact.com. These are all in your sermon notes, right? And some people, you don't know of these things, but you really ought to be checking these things. And is it necessary? Is this even anything I need to say? Ask a mentor. Ask somebody who has some wisdom. Like, it, do I need to engage in this? And then is it kind? Friends, your, your friends will know, right? It, it might be true and helpful and inspiring, but, but is it kind? And so I want to invite you, with all that I am, to invite the Holy Spirit to guide and to strengthen you. Because this is super important. More than you could ever imagine. You know that the germination of this series came out of Kansas City Church of the Resurrection. And the reason it was so important to them is because in 1984, a drug dealer was shot to death at a gas station in St. Louis. And the man who shot him was a light-skinned African-American male about 5'5 in height. And so police look for suspects. This is Daryl Burton. He was dark-skinned and 5'10", but he was called to a police lineup anyway. And two men came forward and they identified Daryl as the murderer. Now, they didn't say necessarily that both of the men who accused him were also on trial, but were going to get a lighter sentence if he was guilty. And Daryl was assigned a public defender who spent about one hour with him before his trial. And the jury convicted him in less than an hour. And Daryl found himself innocent, being sentenced to life without parole. And he remained in prison for 24 years, from 1984 to 2009. And in that time, he went to the law library, and he dedicated to proving his innocence. He also found faith there, asked Jesus and the Holy Spirit to come into his life in a new way. And he wrote more than 600 letters to members of the government, nonprofit organizations, and even to Oprah. To plead his case. And after all that time, there was a confession from a witness who admitted in 1985, all the way back there, that they had the wrong man, that he was too dark. So Daryl worked to have his wrongful conviction overturned. And he often recalls a, a letter that he wrote to Jesus while in prison, and it said, Jesus, if you're real, and you help me get out of this place, not only will I serve you, but I'll tell the whole world about you. And in May 2016, not only was he out of jail, he graduated from St. Paul's School of Theology in Kansas. Uh, the president was on the second row last week of that school. And they gave him an internship at Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City, and now he's on staff as one of the pastors there. The truth set him free. And the truth will set you free as well. Let's be people of the truth. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.